All right, a huge thank you to our youth group worship team. Let's give them a hand, good job. It's fantastic. Welcome to Chinese Church in Christ South Valley. It's good to see you all today. Um, we are continuing in our Mark series. We had a great time at our retreat last week, um, but it's good to see you all. And we come to a, uh, in our Mark series, I think this is totally God's timing that we have landed on the verses that we have for today. And I'll say more about that as we get into it. But if you've got your Bibles, will you turn to Mark chapter 12? And we've been going through Mark pretty fast, but today we are going to look at just five verses because I think these are really important for us today in general, but also in the time and season that we're in. So I'm going to read our passage for today. Mark chapter 12, verses 13 to 17. It should be up here on the screen, but you can follow along in your Bibles as well. Let's read, starting in verse 13. And they sent to him, him being Jesus, some of the Pharisees and some of the Herodians, to trap him in his talk. And they came and said to him, Teacher, we know that you are true and do not care about anyone's opinion. For you are not swayed by appearances, but truly teach the way of God. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay them or should we not? But knowing their hypocrisy, he said to them, why put me to the test? Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. And they brought one and he said to them, whose likeness and inscription is this? They said to him, Caesar's. And Jesus said to them, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. This is God's word. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word. God, we thank you that we could give you praise for who you are this morning, that we could remember that you are a God who is moving and working many times when we don't even see it. And God, we recognize that you, the God of this universe, the creator of all things, God, we recognize that many times it is so easy for us to put our trust in human authorities, human laws, human systems. And yet, God, we want to have our minds and hearts open to your word today um, to see how, God, in this time and in this season, you want to remind us of how you are the one that is the one true hope that you are the greatest authority that we should follow. And in, in the days that are going to follow, Lord, this is going to be such an important reminder for us. And so I pray that we would have open minds and open hearts to hear what you would have to say to us this morning. We love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. A couple of years ago, when I was on sabbatical, it was almost to this day. We missed it by a couple days. But I was on the last day of a one-week uh, golf trip to my favorite place in the world to play golf, which is this resort on the Oregon coast. And a couple of my college friends, we were up there and we had had a really wonderful week. Like most of the time while you're playing golf, you're like looking out at the Pacific Ocean. It's beautiful. It's peaceful. I didn't have to come back to work for a whole nother three weeks. I had had a great week. And my friend and I, there was four of us who started, but people had to go back sooner. And so one of my friends, it was just me and him on the last morning. And when you play golf, you're supposed to do it in groups of four. So if you have less than that, they might pair you up with someone random, right? And so on that last morning, we got paired with this really nice gentleman from Washington, D.C. It was like eight in the morning, and he was just starting his trip. And this was the last round for us on what had been a really fantastic trip. And so, you know, over the course of a golf round, you might get to know someone. You'll introduce yourselves. You'll start talking about things. And this man, being from Washington, D.C., was firmly entrenched in the political world. And it didn't take more than an hour for him to ask us, so who did you guys vote for in the last election? <laughs> yes, it is, right? And so, you know, I forget exactly how the interaction went, but we were definitely not happy that that topic had come up at the end of a super peaceful, like super wonderful trip that had been really relaxing. And after he was out of earshot, my friend turned to me, he said, man, don't talk about politics on the golf course. And he was like more frustrated than I was. But in that moment, it was kind of like, 
it left a sour taste in our, in our mouths for the rest of that round when it had been a truly wonderful week. We're like, man, why did this trip have to end this way? And really, we shouldn't have let it bother us that much. We should have just enjoyed it and kept on going. But I share this story with you to point out that politics are something that are always so prevalent and that never go away. And it's always like, it's always on the topic of conversation. It is almost unavoidable. And it makes me want to go live in a log cabin by myself in the middle of nowhere where I would never have to deal with anyone's political opinions and I could just live at peace by myself. But being a follower of Jesus, I know that that's not how God calls us to live. And so the question for us, nine days away from an election where if you watch the news and you're on social media and you see so many opinions and so much discourse about the future of our country, who you should vote for, who you shouldn't vote for, politics are unavoidable. And I think it is truly God's timing that we have left off. We didn't plan it this way, but this is where we left off in the book of Mark just a few days before we know what's going to be dominating all of the news cycle. And so I think this is an important reminder for us this morning. And so we want to see how this passage does help instruct us to think from a Christian point of view. How should we think about politics? So if you brought your uh, voting materials, go ahead and take them out. And I'm going to tell you from a Christian perspective exactly who you're supposed to vote for in nine days, right? No, just kidding. Okay? We would never say that. But sadly, there are churches who will say from a Christian perspective, this is who you're supposed to vote for, or this is what you are supposed to vote for. And I want to be upfront with you and say, there's our church's uh, strong belief to be apolitical, to understand politics are important, our opinions are important, you can have them, there's nothing wrong with that. But that our job as a church is to teach us what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. And um, I'm going to say something very controversial right now, so please don't misunderstand me. But when I read the Bible, I don't see anywhere in the Bible that tells us from a Christian perspective that we have to vote, okay? I don't see anywhere. This could just be my interpretation. There will be plenty of Christians who would disagree with me, and it may come down to interpretations of certain passage but I don't see anywhere in the Bible that tells us that we have to vote. And so we might think, especially if you're someone who despises politics, kind of the way I do, you might think, okay, that's good. I don't have to worry about it. I don't have to care. And I also think, based on Jesus' response here, that's also not the way we want to think about politics. Because people in our world have strong opinions, and we should care about them. We should at least understand where people are coming from and why they are of such great value to people. And the reason why I think politics are so important to people is that everyone is looking for hope. And people are drawn into the idea that if we pick the right president, if we pick the right congressman, if we pick the right person to be leading us in society, then everything will be fine. And I think if you study history, you would find out that that's truly not the case. And so, but we should ask ourselves from a perspective of a disciple of Jesus. How does God want us to consider what the next nine days are going to be like, how to have conversations with people when it comes to these things? And I think this interaction that Jesus has with the Pharisees is so instructive for us, and it's so timely that we talk about this this morning. We're going to talk about three things from this passage. We're going to talk about uh, the, how this conversation comes about, how it comes about and that politics They bring a lot of hope to people, but it's actually a false hope. And then we're going to see how we can learn from Jesus that there is true hope in trusting Jesus, both in who he is, but also in his response here. And then finally, we want to ask the question then for ourselves this morning, then what is our hope? So we're going to see that politics is the false hope, Jesus is the true hope, and we want to ask the question, what is our hope today? So let's get into it. So first, this, uh, we need to understand the context. Remember, uh, at the start of chapter 12, Jesus rode into, it might have been 11. Uh, yes, in 11. Jesus rode into Jerusalem. So what that means is, this is the last week of Jesus' life on earth. That's the context and the backdrop to these conversations. And as Jesus is now in Jerusalem, 
We've seen how he went to the temple. He confronted them for the ways that they're using the temple for financial gain, and he was uh, angry and turning over the tables. And then uh, Daniel took us through a couple of the passages where he's teaching in parables, and there's a lot of that during Jesus' last week. Because if he knows he's about to die on the cross, he is saying what's important to him that he wants people to hear. And so as he's having these interactions with people in Jerusalem, some of the Pharisees and some of the Herodians, which would be also actually an interesting match. Um, I'm not going to go into all the uh, historical cultural stuff, but the Pharisees um, being the teachers of the law of the nation of Israel and the Herodians being the followers that worked with the Herod, who is the Roman appointed official for this area. Normally, they wouldn't get along, but because people were so concerned about who Jesus was, they're kind of working together to try to put Jesus on the spot here. And so that's the background to what's going on. In the coming weeks, we're going to see more of Jesus's important conversations that he has all in the last week of his life. But for today, this is the one that's happening. And we see Mark writes the purpose. They are trying to trap him by asking this question. Um, I think many of us have read this passage today if you've grown up going to church or if you've been going to church for some time. But let's just make sure we understand what's happening in this passage. How are they trying to trap him? They come to him. First, they try to, um, they try to butter him up, right? They say, teacher, we know that you are true, which is interesting. It would be like, we, and this is what we do as humans when we want to prove a point to someone or when we want to ask someone for something. I might be like, Daniel, die. You're such a good worship leader. By the way, can you lead worship for like the next six weeks so no one else has to do it, right? Like we say things to like butter someone up so we can like then like bring out our agenda for why we might say it. If you read through Jesus's interactions with the Pharisees, there's never been this much deference and this much respect. It's always them arguing with him or challenging them. But they say, teacher, we know you are true. We know you're not swayed by anyone's opinions. But really, they're trying to catch him and put him in a position that is going to anger one group of people, right? And so here's the point. They're asking him, do we have to pay this tax, which was a normal tax that the nation of Rome was uh, influenced or uh, uh, just... Uh, uh, what's the word? I'm, I'm struggling with words, but uh, they're, they're insisting that this tax be paid. It's one of the laws that they have to, that they have to abide by. And so the reason they ask this question is they're, they're trying to catch Jesus um, from this perspective. If he says, yes, you have to pay the tax, he would be less popular with the Jewish people who felt that the nation of Rome was oppressing them in many ways. But if he says no, that could get him arrested with the authorities because the nation of Rome is in charge. There's a lot more that goes into it. But in a nutshell, that's do we see the challenge that's at stake when this question is asked? That is the trap they're trying to put him in in this in this moment. And so what this shows us is that they truly have their own agenda in asking this question. And so what we can see from these first couple verses that's an important truth for us is that politics, there's always an agenda. And that's because as humans, if we're honest with ourselves, we always have agendas as well. And so when, when they're approaching Jesus in this way, we do this when we want to get something that we want. And so um, knowing that that's true, then the question for us is to ask ourselves, well, if every human being has an agenda in some way, do we have the right one? which is truly just to follow Jesus. And so um, the commentator I've been reading a lot in the Gospel of Mark, his name is James Edwards. He's a wonderful scholar on uh, the Gospel of Mark. Here's how he described the question. He said that the Pharisees and the Herodians, they are hoping to impale Jesus on the horns of a dilemma. Like that's how strongly he puts it, that this question, like maybe we don't understand the significance of it because we're not living then, but in their mind, they're thinking, we've got him. We've got him trapped. He's going to anger one group of people, and that's going to cause some problems, and that's going to be challenging for Jesus. And, um, and so just in the way where my friend and I, we didn't want to deal with this guy on the golf course for the rest of the round because he had brought up politics when we we're just trying to have a nice, relaxing morning to end our trip, what we see that's true is that politics always divide. Politics always divide, right? 
And that's because if people have different opinions, I'm not necessarily making a judgment and saying that's bad, but in and of themselves, that is what the process of making laws and selecting leaders, where it's meant to be about the good of the people. I think I will blame the internet, I will blame social media. We now live in a time where it is so much easier to see what divides us rather than what we have in common, right? And so politics always divide, and that's true. And that's why they're trying, they're trying to divide Jesus from one of two groups that will get him in trouble by asking this question. And so what this should teach us, at least initially, is that if politics are always something that is divisive, a lot of times there's this promise of hope. A politician will say, if you vote for me, here's all the things that I'm going to do, and here's how you know that will bring you hope. There are always promises, and yet we often get let down. And then the question for us should be, well, if, if the process of political decision-making and lawmaking, if it's always so divisive, and it's something that tries to promise hope for a better future, then what is the one true hope? And that's where we want to really break down Jesus' response and the implications of it this morning. So if we see that politics, they promise hope, but they don't deliver, then how can we know and trust that Jesus is the true authority that will actually give us hope in our lives. And I hope that's something that gives us hope over the coming days, as there will be a lot of talk about what's happening um, in the election that's coming up. And so in, in verse 15, this is what happens. It starts off with Mark saying that Jesus knows their, hypocr his, their hypocrisy. Jesus is the son of God. We're studying theology in sun youth Sunday school on the, on the mornings. I'm really looking forward to when we're going to talk about what it means that Jesus is fully God and fully man in a couple weeks. But because Jesus has this wisdom that is greater than just human wisdom, he knows. His intuition sets off, they're trying to trap me. He knows what they're trying to do. He knows that they want him to give one answer or the other for people to, for one group of people to be upset and so, but in this case, because he is the son of God, he is smarter and he knows what their purpose is. <clears throat> and I love the way that he goes about answering their question. First, he says, why put me to the test? And so he, it shows he knows their intentions. He knows what they're trying to do. But then he says this, he says, bring me a denarius and let me look at it. Now a denarius is a coin it's a piece of Roman currency at this time, and this was not a small amount of money. Um, if we remember, uh, if we remember um, from uh, when we studied Matthew 18 a while back, uh, a denarius uh, has a certain value. But anyway, it would be like taking out, you know, like it wouldn't be a coin today; it would be a dollar bill. It's like something similar in that regard, right? And so he says, "Look at it," and in today's day of Venmo and credit cards, we forget that actual money has actual like pictures of people on them when we actually look at a coin or when we actually look at a dollar bill. There are great leaders from our past that are on, the, their figure is on the, the, the dollar bill itself or on the coin. And so Jesus says, take out the coin. And he asks, whose image is this? And that's because the currency that was used to pay the taxes had the image of Caesar on it, right? And that's what happened. He said to them, whose likeness and inscription is this? And they said to him, Caesar's. Um, there's a lot of irony in this that I find uh, really interesting because they're asking about the tax. And then Jesus says, take out the coin. Why does Jesus say take out a coin? Probably because he doesn't have it. He doesn't have a coin on him, right? And so the people who are the ones asking about whether he should pay the tax or not, they're the ones with the money. And he says, you have to, if, if you want me to answer this question, you have to take out your coin because I don't have it, right? And I think there's a lot of irony in that because it shows that the people who are asking about the taxes are also the people that have the majority of the money, which is an interesting commentary on society as a whole, but we're not going to go there. But that's, there's some irony that, that, that is here, right? And so it's interesting that the ones who are asking about the taxes are the ones that actually has, have the coin, and Jesus doesn't. And I think that's a really interesting part of his response. And so they're expecting, as we said, that Jesus is going to give a certain answer. They don't know which answer he's going to give, but they're hoping that he's going to divide the crowd and that there will be people that turn against him. But instead, 
while they're expecting him to pick a side, Jesus gives a really genius answer. And first he says, after they say this is Caesar's image, Jesus says to them, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. Now, if we were to break that down into halves, I think when he says render, give, like pay your taxes to the Roman authorities, that's what Jesus means by it, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, I think in that moment, they're thinking, yes, we got him. People are going to turn against him now because it wouldn't be the popular thing from the Jewish people to have to then hear from their leader who supposedly might be their Messiah that they have to pay taxes because they don't want to pay the tax. And they think that they've been oppressed up, up until this point. And they're thinking, yes, we got him. But Jesus is smart enough to give an answer that pays respect to both. And we'll break down the We'll break down the, the second part of uh, the response in a, in a moment. But then if we can zoom out for a second and think, how does this help inform us about what, it's, what it means to be a Christian living in a world that's governed by laws and politics and taxes? The temptation that we might have, and I know I feel this temptation, though I wouldn't act on it because I'm too much of a rule follower, there might be people who will say, well, if I'm a Christian, I don't have to follow the laws of the land. Because I'm a citizen of heaven, and God is my ultimate authority, Jesus is my savior, so I'm not going to follow the American laws, I'm not going to follow all of these things. But Jesus is essentially saying, if there's taxes, pay your taxes. That's, That's what he means here. He says, give to Caesar what is owed to Caesar. And whether that tax was fair or not, Jesus is saying, if that's the tax, you've got to pay it. And I think there's reason for this. This is really important for us. Um, Later on, when the Apostle Paul is writing to the Roman church about what it means to be saved by grace, but also from a practical application standpoint, how to live, he writes uh, a really important passage that I think pertains to what we're talking about here. And this is in Romans 13. I want to read these verses because I think this helps us understand what Jesus is saying. And if Jesus is the Son of God, and if Paul wrote the majority of the New Testament, they should agree I mean, that would make sense, right? And so in Romans 13, the backdrop to Romans is Paul has spent 11 chapters talking about the, in great detail, it's very dense, it's very deep, it's hard to read, but it's really good to read about the truths that we are saved by faith. It's not based on what we've done, it's based on God choosing us, that when, though we are still sinners, that God sent his only son to die for us, Romans 5, 8, and that there is no condemnation that we have to feel because of what Jesus has done, Romans 8.1. When he gets to chapter 12, he says the famous verse, uh, therefore, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. 11 chapters of the goodness of God's love, and then he's saying this is how, as a believer then, that we should live. So when he gets to chapter 13, it pertains to what it's like being a citizen of a nation and how we're supposed to live. Let's read the first seven verses of Romans 13. It says, let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes, for the authorities are ministers of God attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. And so Paul, as he is explaining what it means to be a follower of Jesus in the letter of Romans, he is saying, as a citizen, you got to follow the laws. You've got to obey the laws. And if taxes are owed, you've got to pay the taxes. Why? His purpose is saying, you may not necessarily agree with the type of person that is the leader that, of where you live, 
but God has a purpose for why it is this way. And we may not always understand that purpose. We may not always agree with that purpose. But God has his timing and reason, even if a candidate that you extremely disagree with gets elected. And we don't always know what that purpose is. Sometimes it may take time for us to see what that is. And whether, you, whether it was the candidate you voted for or not, or whether you voted or not, it is our role to follow the laws, to pay the taxes, and as Paul seems to be indicating, live with a clear conscience. And I think that's really important because what this does is if we were to take the kind of a Christian anarchist position where it's like, God is, God is the only one I need to follow, so I'm not going to follow any of the American laws, it might put us, de- definitely will put us in, in conflict with the people that we live around. Because they're, if they're following the laws and we're not following the laws, then that will always, always, always lead to con- conflict. But if we're living in a way that gives us a clear conscience, it gives us the best opportunity to be able to share the love of God with someone else, right? Now, I think a, an objection would be, sometimes people might say, but what about martyrs who stand up for their faith in Jesus in different parts of our world? And what I would hope is that we can be nuanced enough to understand that there are different scenarios where things are called for. I think what Paul is saying here is generally how we're supposed to live. And yet, in a country where if it is illegal to be a Christian, if someone professes their faith in Jesus, I think God would honor them for doing that. I think it's a unique situation that is not exactly what Paul is talking about. Does that make sense? Can we understand there might be situations where the only thing we're listening to is the voice of God, but generally speaking, we want to follow Paul's guidance here that says we want to obey the authorities, we want to obey the laws of the land for the purpose of having a clear conscience where we can be in relationship with one another. I think that's of great value so that we might be able to share the love of Jesus Christ with others. And so that's what Paul is saying here in Romans. And so when Jesus is saying that you have to pay the tax to Caesar, I think many people, including some of the disciples, were thinking, oh, here we go. Jesus is going to say we don't have to pay taxes. He's going to overthrow the Romans. We're going to be saved politically. We're no longer going to be under their role. Jesus not only doesn't say that, but Jesus himself actually demonstrates what it means to be subject to the authorities that he's living under. How do we know this? Spoiler alert to maybe a month from now or six weeks from now or whenever we get to Mark chapter 14. But when Jesus is arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane and they come to put him on trial to eventually sentence him to death and the disciples, if you remember, they start to defend him, right? Uh, Peter takes his sword and he cuts off the ear of one of the officials that comes to arrest Jesus. What does Jesus say? Yeah, get him, Peter, defend me. No, no. He says, and this is the description in Mark chapter 14. Do we have it up here on the screen? Yeah, starting in verse 46. So as Jesus is being arrested, they laid hands on him and seized him. But one of those who stood by drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. And Jesus said to them, have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? And forgot to put it up there. But what in some of the in one of the other passages, what Jesus what Jesus says is, do you not know I could call down an army from heaven to defend me right now in this moment? But he doesn't. He lets himself be arrested. He goes to the cross because he knows that is God's purpose for him at that point. We don't always know why certain politicians get elected. I'm sure we can all think of ways when there's been a politician that's been elected where we're like, how did that happen? I can't believe that person's in charge. Like, look at their character. or Look at these decisions they've made. But we're saying that from our human perspective. And if we are disciples of Jesus Christ, if we know that the God of this universe, who created this universe, who knows all things, is, is all-powerful, we can trust in his timing and his judgment. And what Paul is saying in Romans is that it may seem at times like a political leader like is doing the opposite of what God would want. And I'm sure many times we would have that opinion. But we need to zoom out and remember that God is in control and we can trust him that he has his purpose for all things. 
And when we live in this way, if we can live in a way that's respectful and abiding by the laws and, under, and paying taxes and all the things that Paul says we're supposed to do, then it gives us the best chance to have good relationships with those around us who don't know Jesus. And there might be times, there might be exceptions to this, and hopefully we can see that there might be a difference and we're following the Holy Spirit, but it gives us the best chance to share the love of God with others around us and to help others see as well that there's a hope greater than politics in this world. And if we follow the laws and we don't freak out when we don't agree with them, I think people will have no choice but to notice and see, like, man, like, I think if someone has the mindset, oh my gosh, this candidate who I think is totally unfit for office gets elected, that it's the end of the world. If we don't have that mindset, I truly think people will notice and see that there's something different, that our hope comes from somewhere else, and that people will want to ask about where that help comes from. And so I think when Jesus says, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, the application for us is to live in the way that Paul talks about here in Romans chapter 13. And so what's interesting, um, when I was reading the commentary uh, from, from my guy, Mr. Edwards, um, he says something else that I really loved in thinking about Jesus' response. He says, if the image of the coin is Caesar's, inevitably what that means is the money essentially belongs to the government. Because you might have it for a time, but you have to pay your taxes. And it's stamped with the image of the Caesar showing that it is the money that works in, in this particular land. And so he's saying, if Caesar's image is on the coin, then the money belongs to Caesar. And we've, we've done sermons about money before and, and how Jesus teaches about money. And in general, we want to use our money to, uh, just to be able to further the kingdom of God. But there are so many evil ways that, e- that money gets used. But Edwards' point, he said, in the same way that the coin bears the image of Caesar, then the coin belongs to Caesar. But if you go back to creation, where it says we were created in the image of God, our face might not be on a coin, it might not be on a, on a dollar bill, but as followers of Jesus, we bear the image of the living God. And how we live is something that people can take note of. And people will be able to notice that far more than if we remember whose face is on a $20 bill. Whose face is on a $20 bill? People know. See? Oh, Andrew Jackson. Okay. But it took us a moment. We didn't remember right away. But my point is this. If we live in a way that exudes godly character, people will see whose image we are bearing. And that is God, our creator. And that's why we want to live in this way. I think that's a fascinating connection here to think about the images, both on the coin, but for us as Jesus' followers. So then, if Jesus is answering this in a genius way, where it says the passage ends saying they marveled at him, it's like they, this was not the answer they were expecting. They were expecting a riot, and Jesus will inevitably come into conflict with the authorities at the end of this week, but we'll get there in our series on Mark. But I want us to ask ourselves the question then. If we're saying that politics is something that always divides, that political candidates can let us down, even though we might think they're making promises that usually end up turning out to be false, and that Jesus is the true hope, we've got to ask ourselves this question this morning. What is my hope right now? And for the next nine days leading up to like when we see the election, are we putting all our hope in the results of it? Because I know in my life, I've certainly consciously or subconsciously done that before. And the way I want to think about how this passage is instructing me is to remember the hope I have regardless of what happens on November 5th. That our hope comes from the one who answered this question in a genius way, who will be a different kind of leader, not saying, if you vote for me, I will do this. But he says, no, I will go to the cross and give my life for yours, because that's the kind of leader and authority that I am going to be. That's our true hope. That's someone that we can trust. Not someone who may promise something and do something else. As a matter of fact, Jesus, prior to this, on multiple occasions, has promised that he will go to the cross and die on the cross on our behalf. And so I want us to, I want us to end with uh, thinking through some application that this passage can help us to think about. And so there's more than this, but these are some of the things that I would like us to kind of draw out of what's going on from this conversation. 
And so as Paul mentioned this, the first thing that I think this passage teaches us when Jesus doesn't immediately say, don't pay your taxes, go riot, go revolt. But he says, no, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. In the same ways that Paul wrote about God's purpose for officials that might be in position of leadership for a certain reason, can we accept that God has a role for politicians to play that may be outside of our thinking? I think that's really important for us, that we might accept that God's plan may not always match up with our plan. We might look at two candidates and we might say, that one's God's, that one's not. But inevitably, the longer you live, you might see, hey, it's not always that black and white. It gets a little more gray than that. But can we accept that God has a role for politicians to play that may be outside of our thinking? And secondly, in the same way Jesus, Jesus says, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and in the same way where Paul talks about what it means to be a Christian living uh, in a way that is bringing honor and respect, but also obeying laws and paying taxes, we need to observe the laws of our land to give us a good relationship with those around us. And that's why when people can see the ways that we live, people can see the image of God that he put into us when we were created. People can see the Holy Spirit that fills us the moment that we put our faith in Jesus Christ. If we live in a way that is a blessing to others around us, people will inevitably want to know why. And we can be bearers of the good news to people in this way. Next, we need to pray for our leaders and our country. And maybe it can go bigger than that. Maybe we need to pray for our city or our neighborhood in things that we may not always agree with or know how to make, like, practical change in the places that we live. And while I'm going to sit here and say, I don't see anywhere that the Bible says that we have to necessarily vote for one thing or another, I think the Bible does call us to give respect to our leaders in the way that Romans 13 talks about, and it should be something that we pray about. And so my first inclination anytime something doesn't go my way is to complain. Like, you guys might see me preaching or leading worship, and you have a very favorable opinion of me, but if you see me, like, Monday through Saturday, like, I'm a big whiner, and I like to complain, and I have very strong opinions on many things, and I'm convicted by the fact that rather than only complain about what's wrong, I need to pray for those who are in position in our church, in our neighborhoods, in the school that I coach basketball at in all the places that I go, rather than complain or point out all the ways that we are divided, because there are many, am I praying for those that are in positions of leadership and asking that they would lead from a godly perspective and that we would receive godly leadership in that way as well? And I think that is definitely an application of what is going on here. But finally, I think the really important question that isn't concrete, that isn't black and white, Jesus ends this passage by saying, not only give to Caesar what is Caesar's, but he says you need to give to God what is God's. And if God is the ultimate authority, if Jesus is going to demonstrate why he is so trustworthy on the cross in the week to come, we need to ask ourselves as individuals, what does it mean for me having the image of God with how God created me, having this hope that God's given me through the presence of the Holy Spirit, what does it mean to live in a way that gives that honor to God? And that might look very different for each one of us, but that's an important question for us to have. So just to review, sadly we see politics are a false hope. They can divide us, they often do divide us. And I would say something that was very sad, but it's important to be said from the 2020 election, is that there were disagreements in our church about which candidate you should vote for, there were angry conversations, and there were people who left our church over the issue of politics. Now, I don't say that just to look down on us or to single us out, because this was sadly a very common thing in 2020. When I talked to other pastors from other churches, there were so many political arguments within the church. And what I really am thankful for is I really do believe that as a church, I think we've learned from that in the last four years. I think people have seen how angry the conversations have been, and though people, uh, people's political opinions may be just as divided as they were back then, we can have conversation in a way that honors one another without tearing each other down. We can listen to different opinions and be more informed and at least understand what's going on and learn how to have sympathy and empathy for those around us. And so if politics often always divide, 
we see that Jesus, he outsmarts the Pharisees here, and it's a preview for how he's going to give his life for ours, how we can trust that he is the true hope. And so really, I kind of want to sum it up like this. Like, I want to ask the question, what are our lives going to look like 10 days from now, on November 6th, the day after the election? Because what I've realized about myself in like the very emotionally charged presidential elections, I've realized that on election day, I'm always watching the news and I have my political opinion on each time. Sometimes it's stronger than others. But I, I genuinely do think as I'm watching the news, I think that the next day, the whole world depends on the outcome of that election. Like, oh my gosh, if this candidate wins tomorrow, like Wednesday, the world's gonna look like this or the world's gonna look like this. Or even like in the craziness of the January 6th thing that happened many, uh, four years ago, like seeing, I was like, oh my gosh, the implications of what's going on means our country's gonna look very different the next day and therefore my life is gonna be very different the next day. And I've talked to youth group members who are just distraught when a candidate that they really despise gets elected or the one that they were hoping for doesn't get elected. And we live in a world where we think if the election results don't go the way we want, that our lives are going to be different the next day. And I think now, being 42 years old, having seen, if you do the math, at least 10 presidential cycles, I've realized that that Wednesday, it matters a lot less who the leader of our country is than I actually give it credit for. We've referenced multiple times, um, it's a part of our church history and DNA that though we don't say it all the time, but um, if you know, if you've been to our church for several years, you know we've experienced a lot of tragedy in our church at various moments. We've lost youth group members or youth group parents long before we would think that it was their earthly time to go. And I can tell you on those days, it does not matter who the president is. It does not matter who is in control. But the thing that got us through those times was that our God is the one that we can trust. And that is what is most important. That is our God that we worship. And so I wanna challenge you on November 5th, I'm gonna go coach my basketball game I'm going to go in the morning, every Tuesday morning, Daniel and I read through the passage of what's being preached, regardless of who's preaching. I want to live my life that way. And that's not to be insensitive to people who have strong political opinions. We should listen. We should discuss. We should understand why people are looking for hope in certain places. But I pray also that we can give them the hope that we have, the hope of the living God. Let's pray together. God, we thank you that you are a God who loves us so much, that you've given us your word. And God, also you've given us your truth to see the practical ways that we can live in a broken and fallen world, in a world that's often divided because of political opinions or because of just the ways that as humans we inevitably fall short of your glory. God, we thank you that we have such a wonderful example in your son, Jesus Christ, that his life ultimately, was lived to serve others. And God, as bearers of your image, I pray that our lives would do the same. God, as we get closer and closer to November 5th, Lord, I pray that we would know that our hope is not found in who's elected or who is not, but our hope is that you, the God of this universe, that you love us and that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, into this world so that we could know what a true authority is, what true trustworthiness is. And so God, as we sing this last song together, I pray that we would give you the worship and the honor that you deserve. We love you. We pray this in Jesus' name.